Independence, Book One of the Legacy Ship Trilogy by Nick Webb, performed by Greg Tremblay. Prologue. Ergoyen Sector, San Martin System, Asteroid Belt, Asteroid Hauler Magdalena Isakar. Signal received. Five dash twelve dash twenty six eighty. Twenty three hundred hours forty eight minutes twenty five seconds. Message decrypted. It's time. End message. Danny had been waiting in deep space for the signal for six days. Nearly an entire week of half-sitting, half-floating on his ass. The gravity plates only at one-tenth power to conserve fuel. Water and food supplies dwindling down to near nothing. One more ancient, stale granola bar, and he knew he'd vomit. And suffering through the constant banter of his two crewmates. Thankfully, they'd gone to sleep hours ago. Only Danny had seen the message come in from their mysterious client, just as he'd hoped. Passing it through the ten-odd levels of decryption, only to discover the text itself was only two enigmatic words. It's time. Damn, these guys were paranoid. There must be a ton of platinum bullion in that giant crate down in the cargo hold. Or fluff coke. Was he a drug runner now? Shit. Or maybe a handful of Regalian mail-order brides in his stasis. Whatever it was, it couldn't be within the law. Law-abiding citizens didn't send hyper-encrypted messages to clandestine asteroid haulers this far out on the fringes of the United Earth space. He had only sneaking suspicions of who the client was, but it didn't matter. The money was good, and the bonus hourly pay from the GPC was icing on the cake. The job had been top priority. He wondered if the Secretary General himself had approved the job. The Galactic People's Congress wasn't big enough yet to preclude the old man himself from giving the thumbs up on even standard delivery missions. That would change, though. And this was no standard delivery mission. With gravity still at one-tenth, he pushed off from his bed, launched through the air of his cramped living quarters, and landed on both feet in front of the door a few meters away. As queasy as he got in low grav, he loved the feeling of being a superhero. A hero? Isn't that why he'd signed up with the GPC in the first place? The fight against tyranny and oppression and greed and all that shit? United Earth thought it could bully everyone into line, but it hadn't counted on people like Danny fucking Proctor. Watch your mouth. His aunt's voice automatically echoed in his mind. Was it the freedom of piloting his own asteroid hauler at only twenty-one years old? If he'd entered IDF Academy like his aunt had urged him to, he'd be rotting in classrooms for the next five years. Promotions there would only happen if he learned how to kiss his commander's ass with enough tongue. The integrated defense force of UE had become a behemoth in the three decades since the decisive victory of the Second Swarm War. But bureaucracies were bureaucracies. And if bureaucracy was the noun, then ass-kissing was its verb. On the other hand, if he'd signed on to the Merchant Marine, he'd be mopping gravity deck plates for the next ten years before they'd let him even breathe on any flight controls. But this... This was freedom. This was life. His own ship, even if he didn't own it, he flew it, and that was just as good. He trailed his hand along the old corridor walls as he bounced his way down to the operations center. Ridley and Taggart would be asleep, or still having sex. It seemed like they never stopped having sex. A week of floating next to a giant rock in the middle of empty space was conducive to breaking down inhibitions, and his two crewmates had succumbed to the flesh spectacularly. Either way, he wasn't about to wake them. This was his mission. His ship. This was freedom. Once across the threshold, he jumped up a few meters and sailed across the operations center, landing cleanly in the navigator's chair, with the ease that came from months at low grav. He entered in the coordinates for their next stop, Sangre de Cristo, the fourth planet in the San Martin system. Just a colony, really. A million or so religious fanatics had tired of the oppressive hand of a distant U.E. and its tin-eared government on San Martin, and had set off on their own. Chovic Orion Industries had been only too happy to provide the domes, 
and contract out the rest of the building effort, and the GPC was far enough in bed with Shovik Orion that he assumed plenty of wallets were embiggening with each shipment to the fledgling colony. His own included, so no complaints. The main drive activated with an ear-deafening roar, one irritating quirk of the ancient freighter, and the inertial cancelers struggled to keep up with the 3G burn. He could Q-jump in and save half a day, of course, but the client had specified no Q-jumping. Harder to track that way. Q-jump signatures could be seen half a system away with the most basic sensor packages. Luckily, Sangre de Cristo wasn't that far from the asteroid belt. They'd be there in four hours, and with any luck, Ridley and Taggart would still be asleep, or having their morning coffee, or their morning screw. He dozed off after setting the nav computer to autopilot. The ship would swivel 180 halfway out to Sangre and automatically start the decel burn, and he'd need to be awake and alert for the actual delivery. Planetary re-entry on an old rickety freighter like the Magdalena Issachar was like trying to screw a discount mutated whore on Rigel III while half drunk. It required a certain amount of concentration, but not so much concentration that you realized with horror what the hell you were doing. It had only seemed like his eyes were closed for a few minutes. The alarm was persistent, and it took him several shakes of his head to realize that that particular flavor of alarm was a proximity detector. Shit, something was close. Close enough to trigger a proximity alarm. He scrambled to activate the external video feed and brought up the view on his screen. They were nearly there. Sangre de Cristo glistened far below its massive oceans reflecting the distant sun's weak blue light. Only internal mantle heating kept the water liquid. He could barely make out the massive, kilometers-long cylindrical domes dotting the rusty-colored eastern island, each transparent, city-wide window keeping the noxious carbon dioxide atmosphere at bay, while letting in enough light to sustain photosynthesis in the genetically modified plants that could survive on such minuscule solar irradiance. But what caught his eye was the ship less than a kilometer away, coming in fast. It was smaller than the Magdalena Issachar, but even at this distance he could see it was armed to the teeth. He didn't recognize any hull markings at this distance. It was obviously human. Dalmasi or Sciora ships looked unmistakably alien. But their transponder was running silent, a flagrant violation of United Earth law, and Russian Confederation law. Hell, Every human government required active transponders, even the GPC. Some in the UE might consider the Galactic People's Congress a terrorist organization. But at least we keep our transponders running. Unidentified ship, this is the Magdalena Issachar out of Britannia on a delivery mission to Sangre. Morning, fellas. Please respond, over. He tried to keep his voice level and conversational. He felt anything but... Other ships never flew right up to you close enough to wave through the window, not unless you were intentionally docking with each other or, Danny feared, being forcefully boarded. Unidentified ship, please respond. Nothing. Whatever they were playing at, the other ship was getting uncomfortably close. He toyed with the idea of making a break for it. Would they fire on him? The closer they got, the tighter the knot in Danny's stomach pulled. He flipped on the navigational controls and started adjusting the Magdalena's course. The other ship matched his movement, and moments later another alarm started flashing on his board. They were targeting weapons. Come on, fellas, let's not get carried away here. The message was clear. Don't move, or you're dead. From the sleek lines of the other ship, the heavy armaments and general lack of scuffing and micrometeor impacts... It was clear this was no pirate ship trying to relieve him of his cargo. Someone knew about that crate down in the cargo hold, and whatever was in it was worth shooting at his ship. It was worth his life. A docking tube began to extend out from the other ship's port, and on instinct Danny leapt out of his chair, soared across the operations center, and landed in the corridor at a bounding run. Running at one-tenth G meant a series of powerful one-legged jumps, and by the time he reached the cargo bay, he'd only touched the floor five times. Inside the bay, he ducked into the auxiliary airlock just as he heard the ominous metallic sounds of the two ships mating together 
at the main docking port. At a touch to the wall panel, he closed the door most of the way shut, leaving just enough of a slit for him to see out into the space beyond and part of the walkway that circled the upper part of the cargo bay. And just in time, the docking port opened with a groan, indicating something on the other side was forcing it. Through the slit, he could see several figures in vacuum battle armor launched through the hatch, brandishing guns. Big guns. One motioned to another and pointed towards the giant crate in the center of the cargo bay. The indicated soldier let his gun hang at his shoulder while he pulled out a hand terminal and started working the controls as the other two guards stood around him. Hey, Danny! What the hell is going on? I thought I heard... Through the slit, he watched as Matt Ridley, who'd apparently just woken up, padded barefoot onto the catwalk surrounding the bay, still rubbing his eyes. He wore only underwear, which didn't do much to conceal his raging morning wood. His mohawk had lost some of its usual stiffness and seemed to flop like a rooster's comb. A loud crack echoed through the bay, and Danny had to bite down on his fist when he realized what had just happened. A hole blossomed in the middle of Ridley's forehead, and a fine pink mist had sprayed out behind him. He still looked confused as hell as he collapsed. The one-tenth G seemed to take forever to pull the dead young man to the deck. Denny's stomach rose up into his mouth, and he fought the watery feelings of nausea beginning to overtake him. He had to get out. He had to get out. The locker nearby held a vacuum suit. All he had to do was put it on without drawing the attention of the soldiers, open the auxiliary airlock, and jump out. Easy. He could do this. He had to get out. And then what? It didn't matter. All that mattered now was getting away from those guns. He had to get out. The image of the pink mist spraying back from Ridley's head, of him jerking back as the bullet pierced his brain, forced itself back into his thoughts. And to avoid retching, he set himself to work. He pushed the door closed all the way, locked it, and frantically started pulling on the suit, finally clamping the helmet on less than a minute later. Luckily, the data connection to the ship was working, so he brought up the heads-up display and navigated over to the video feed from the cargo bay. Two of the soldiers were pulling the front panel off the crate, and then one of them retrieved something from a bag hanging from his shoulder, some sort of electronic device. He attached it to the contents of the crate with a magnetic lock. Holy shit! The contents of the crate! There was only one thing in there resting on the center of a pallet. It looked... Remarkably like an atmospheric re-entry nuclear missile. Square tail fin and all. A gentle sway in the ship's gravity field told him that the engines had cut out, and the inertial cancelers compensated for the change in the acceleration vector. They'd arrived at Sangre. And just in time. He worked the airlock controls with one hand while trying to get the comm open to Taggart. Silence. Either still asleep, or... He shook the thought and initiated the airlock sequence. The air cycled out of the chamber and the outer hatch opened, and not looking back he pulled himself out. Sangre de Cristo's oceans glistened below, and he could just make out one of the vast cylindrical domes on one of the peninsulas. He clung tightly to the handholds lining the hull and started climbing around the Magdalena, away from the view of the other ship. A whisper crackled in his ear. Matt, where are you? Matt? Danny, I hear people out there. Matt, I... He was about to key in a response when the sound of a door opening came through the calm, followed by a sudden sharp intake of breath by Taggart, and a whispered, Oh, God. And a second later a loud crack, identical to the one that had emptied Matt's head. Danny tried to cover his mouth, pawing at his face shield, putting up a valiant effort to stem the flow of vomit. The rancid smell pierced his nose, and he swore as he realized the contents of his stomach now covered the face shield of the helmet, obscuring his view. Below him, he felt the maneuvering thrusters of the ship burn. He hadn't programmed that. The intruders were moving the ship. The Magdalena Issachar slowly turned to point straight down to the planet below. He looked back. The other ship had retracted its docking tube and fired its own engines. The Magdalena started accelerating, the pull of his own inertia nearly broke his grip on the handhold. With a dull ache in his roiling stomach, he realized he had a choice to make. 
The soldiers, whoever they were, had clearly set the ship on a course that would take it down into the atmosphere and crash on Sangre de Cristo. Bail now, or try to re-enter the ship and override whatever course the soldiers had set. And that missile. There was no question what they were trying to do. He made his choice, pulling himself back toward the auxiliary airlock. There was still time. He touched the exterior control panel. Not operational. He yanked on the manual override, which didn't budge. He'd been locked out. Whatever tech the soldiers had, they'd been able to override the manual override's controls, which he thought was technically impossible. That left the only alternative. He crouched down on the side of the ship, perpendicular to the horizon, and with a grunt, he jumped as hard as he could. The ship fell away from him, and now that he was free of its acceleration, the Magdalena Issachar shot forward, speeding towards its doom. He wondered if he'd jumped clear in time to make orbit, or if he'd similarly fall to his death. Would the atmosphere burn him up first, or would he get to at least enjoy a few minutes of freefall? Why was he thinking of enjoying a freefall? He'd just watched one friend get his brains blown out and heard it happen to the other friend. He was fucked. Danny, language! His aunt's sharp voice cut into his thoughts. If he wasn't about to die, he'd have laughed at the absurdity of hearing her scolding in his head, even as he drifted through space in freefall. Time seemed to elongate, stretch out past all recognition of seconds or minutes, and he could have sworn that at one point he fell asleep, though he granted that he may have been hallucinating. Either way, the small engine exhaust plume that was the Magdalena burned faster and faster towards the surface, until it was just a tiny dot set against one of the habitation domes. Bye, Mags, he whispered. And then the nuclear missile detonated. Danny's eyes automatically closed, his hands covered his helmet, and even through the hands, his eyelids, the face shield, and the vomit, the intense glare of the piercing radioactive light made him cry out. A minute later, a mushroom cloud. And a minute after that, he started to feel the faint roar in his suit that announced he, too, was entering the outer fringe of the atmosphere. And strangely enough, rather than focus on his own impending death, all he could think about was the cargo, the mysterious customer, and the equally mysterious boarding party that had killed his friends and killed his ship. Killed his future. As the roar intensified and his arms and legs began to feel the drag of the rarefied air, another thought struck him as he watched the mushroom cloud billow up to the upper atmosphere. Whoever they were, they were trying to start a war. They were. They were trying to start a war. Chapter 1 Oxford Novum University, Whitehaven, Britannia. Curie Building, Lecture Hall 201. Professor Shelby Proctor paused her lecture mid-sentence to glare at the monitor on her lectern. A text box had popped up, flashing red. Priority 1. Integrated Defense Fleet, CENTCOM. Priority 1. Bullshit. IDF could wait. I retired ten years ago. I'm not their lapdog anymore. She clicked the message off with a wave of her hand and turned back to the chalkboard in front of the packed auditorium. She was the only professor that she knew of at Oxford Novum University that used a chalkboard. The only professor on Britannia, for that matter. But she was sixty-eight years old, a decorated former fleet admiral, a friggin' war hero, and, most importantly, an expert in xenobiology. She'd use whatever the hell she wanted. So, you can see that the mere presence of the mitochondrial DNA structure within the Sciura cell walls suggests not only a similar evolutionary pattern to species native to Earth, but also implies that primordial prokaryotic cell union into eukaryotic structures is not only one possible basis for advanced life, but perhaps the only basis, especially given that similar structures are seen in Dolmasi cells and every other fossilized remains of now-dead civilizations that we've happened upon in the power vacuum left behind by the swarm. Is it true that you fought the last swarm carrier twelve years ago, Professor Proctor? Destroyed it? 
The only living swarm matter left in the galaxy? An interruption. Damn kids. She turned around from the chalkboard to face the rows and rows of university students. They were getting younger by the year, it seemed. And if she wasn't mistaken, stupider. Or was that just the cranky old fleet admiral talking? Stupider. She could almost hear her proper English major mother berate her. That is not only incredibly off-topic, young man, but also highly classified. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you where you sit. Her eyes drilled into him like antimatter beams, and she could tell the student wasn't sure if she was joking or not. And don't assume that I'm kidding. The kid blushed. Good. Proctor struggled to keep a smirk off her own face. Oh. Uh, I mean, everyone talks about it, so I assumed... I, I mean, I thought that since you were there, fighting the swarm over Earth and Britannia and stuff, I mean, I thought you could tell us a little... He trailed off as her eyes drilled into him again, and he started squirming. You know what happens when you assume? You make an ass out of you, and... Only you, I'm a horrible speller. Some of the class laughed. For the rest of them, she added, Normally, assuming makes an ass out of you and me. But today, the moniker belongs exclusively to the young man in the back row. The rest of the class laughed. He flustered even more. But, uh, I mean, I was just thinking that the genocide of the swarm might, you know, be helpful to talk about, and just because you're able to open your mouth and dribble verbal diarrhea, forming barely intelligible phrases which I assume are English, spilling sensitive, classified information out for all our enemies to hear and take advantage of, does not make it unclassified. This may not be a military college, young man. That does not mean that we won't strictly observe security protocols while I am your teacher. The kid was clearly embarrassed. His face turned red and he started playing with the dozens of piercings hanging off his ear. It was just like all the other kids in this generation, oblivious to the sacrifices made by the ones before him. Her sacrifices. Blithely throwing around words like genocide that he hardly understood the meaning of. Proctor grimaced as she saw him begin to open his mouth again. Damn, Prof! It was just a question. No need to get snippy or snippy. Proctor dropped the chalk, and it clattered into several pieces when it broke on the floor. Listen, young man. I realize your hearing must be completely shot, what with all the nano-dildos sticking through your earlobes, so I'll repeat it once more for you. We don't talk military shit in this classroom. We talk science. Got it? The auditorium was as quiet as space itself. The student started packing up his things. Professor, this is a microaggression. Your words are incredibly hurtful, and I'm going to file a report with the Committee for Respect and Inclusion and get you reprimanded for speaking hurtfully to a student who only asked— Oh, please, she began, picking up the pieces of chalk. We both know what you were implying. That I'm some kind of— genocidal maniac for finally destroying the last remnant of the race that terrorized our civilization for decades. Let me tell you, young man, you have no idea what it was like out there. No idea. None of them. How could they? How could anyone? But now that the stopper was released, there was no holding back. No idea. Never knowing when death would find you, Wondering if your next engagement with the swarm would be your last, so unless you want to see what a macro-aggression looks like, I suggest you hightail it out of my classroom and get your ass into dick-knitting 101. The look on the kid's face was priceless, and well worth the official reprimands she knew would trickle down from the administration. Same as the last time she'd lost her cool and went to town on the previous unsuspecting clueless student. So far, there hadn't been any investigations or committee hearings, just the university president taking her aside at the last senatorial reception and giving her a stern but deferential talking to. She was the former fleet admiral of IDF, after all. She fought alongside the frickin' hero of Earth himself, Captain Timothy Granger. 
he got up and left in a huff, and the faces of the remaining students seemed to be evenly split between looks of worshipful adoration and distasteful sanctimony. But she was too old to care what people thought about her. All that mattered now was the science, the teaching, and kicking back with a glass of the finest Cabernet at night. Now, where were we? Yes, mitochondrial DNA. One interesting facet of the most recent knowledge exchange with the Sciora generational ship Magnanimity is that their cell structure is the door to her right creaked open, revealing two burly military MPs in IDF fatigues escorting some top IDF brass, followed by a face out of her past. He strode in purposefully, as if he owned the place. The overhead lights gleamed off the white fleet admiral bars on his shoulders. The old man nodded once, and glancing at the rows of students, said, Admiral Proctor, I'm sorry to intrude, but I'm afraid it's urgent. The jackass. She could see his subtle grin at the students as rustling whispers spread through the auditorium like wildfire. Everyone recognized the head of IDF, Integrated Defense Force, United Earth's interstellar military organization. He always loved performing in front of a captive audience, occupying the center of attention and being fawned over by adoring civilians. Class dismissed, said Proctor, waving them all off. When the last student had gathered her things and closed the door, Proctor turned back to the man. Fleet Admiral Oppenheimer, to what do I owe the pleasure? Shall we? He began. It's good to see you. An extended hand. She ignored it. I wish I could say the same, Christian. She wanted to say worse, but even so his face cringed slightly. He had replaced her as Fleet Admiral of IDF ten years ago, and the parting had not been amicable. They hadn't clashed when they first met, years ago, during the emergency of the Second Swarm War. The derelict constitution had been sacrificed to hold off the swarm during one of the last violent skirmishes, and the warrior was destroyed by overwhelming swarm antimatter beams. Granger and Proctor had mustered their surviving crew aboard the Victory, where Oppenheimer was serving as XO. He'd been level-headed and down-to-earth then, not the political showman he was today. There were three things that could fundamentally change a person. Time, alcohol, and managing a bureaucracy. And Oppenheimer suffered from at least two of the three. We have a situation, he said, withdrawing his hand and beginning to pace across the front of the auditorium. The two MPs accompanying him stepped out the door, as if by previous arrangement with him. Something is happening in the Aragoyan sector, and in the Dolmasi sectors near it. The Dolmasi would never admit it to us, but our intel is unmistakable. Something has them reeling. Her heart skipped a beat. Swarm? No. She relaxed a hair, though she considered what her reaction meant. She was responsible for their complete and utter annihilation years ago and even though she'd taken umbrage at the sniping from the micro-aggressed student suggesting that she was responsible for genocide. Well, it was half true. She felt it, the... guilt? Was she a monster? No, she was following orders, saving Earth, saving civilization. And she slept well at night. But half true all the same. Oppenheimer continued. Not that we can tell, anyway, which is very little. But the attack signatures are definitely not swarm, it's something else. He stopped pacing and faced her. Something new. Something big. She shrugged. Not my problem anymore, Christian. Give an old woman her retirement. Why don't you send the Chesapeake out there? Captain Diaz is more than capable. He served with me on the Constitution, the Warrior, the Victory— and even the Chesapeake itself, it's the friggin' flagship. And if anyone can handle the situation, it's him. Oppenheimer nodded, stroking his chin. We did, last night. A pause. He leaned against the chalkboard and seemed almost reluctant to continue. Damn it. She knew what he was about to say before he even started. We just received word this morning that Captain Diaz is dead. The Chesapeake is destroyed.
The Chesapeake is destroyed. Chapter 2 Oxford Novum University, Whitehaven, Britannia Curie Building, Lecture Hall 201 Destroyed? How? Proctor groped for her chair and collapsed into it. Diaz was an old friend, served as her XO for years aboard the Chesapeake before she'd left Starship Command to become the fleet admiral and lead all of IDF. Worst decision of her life. We lost Metaspace contact with the Chesapeake early this morning, after they reported engaging a ship of unknown design and origin out in the Irigoyen sector. A scout ship was sent to pick up their trail, and all it found was debris and signs of an intense battle. No sign of the unknown ship. Proctor couldn't believe it. Captain Diaz was the best officer in the fleet as far as she was concerned, and the Chesapeake was IDF's flagship, there were other ships that were more powerful, others that were larger, and every single ship in the fleet was more modern by far. But Chesapeake was the last of the legacy fleet, the handful of ships whose thick tungsten armor and ability to sustain massive amounts of damage helped save Earth not once, but twice from swarm incursions. And now it was gone. The last of the legacy fleet, gone forever. An era had officially passed. Did they send back any visuals? Negative. There was just no time between when they engaged it and when they were destroyed. We literally know nothing about this threat, other than the fact that it handily destroyed our flagship in less than five minutes. What about the terrorist action on Sangre de Cristo? Is this related? Same sector? Oppenheimer shook his head. Not that we can tell. We still have no idea who did it. The GPC claims it was us. Our intel points to a radical faction of the Russian Confederation. The RC claims it was Grangerite fanatics. The Grangerite patriarch announced on the news this morning that he suspects the CIDR, which the Chinese, of course, vehemently deny. CIDR thinks it's us, too. Just a massive fucking headache. Watch your language, she replied automatically. But she was lost in thought trying to make connections between the two incidents. The Admiral ignored her. Whoever dropped that bomb will pay. Ever since last week we've been escorting the relief ships and the humanitarian convoys heading out to Sangre. Completely destroyed one of the habitation domes, about 50,000 dead. And the rest of the domes are in a state of pandemonium. They all think they're next. Riots, food shortages, the works. And with all the political bullshit going on, Everyone pointing fingers at each other, half of them aimed at us. We get this. An unknown ship, completely foreign design, not human, not Domasi, not Sciora, and not responding to any of our hails. And now the Chesapeake. He trailed off. Professor Proctor stood up and grabbed hold of the lectern, using it to steady herself. The news came as a shock, and she suspected why Admiral Oppenheimer had come. Given her lifelong experience with not only the swarm, but all things alien, be it Domasi, Sciora, Quiasi, Findiri, or the handful of long-dead civilizations destroyed by the swarm in their ten-thousand-year scourge across the galaxy, he was most likely going to ask for help understanding the new threat. To study up, and as the old adage said, science the shit out of it. Fine. Send me everything you've got. I'll make my recommendations to the Joint Chiefs once I've had a chance to go over the material. And I'll even set up a rapid-response science team, if you manage to bring back any samples or recordings of the new threat. I imagine that, Shelby, I'm not here asking for your help in a lab. We don't have time for science. She turned to face him. Then what the hell are you here for, Christian? I'm here because I need you back. I need you to take a ship and go figure this out before it destroys us all. She laughed out loud. Christian, you can't be serious. I'm almost seventy years old. I teach Xenobiology 101, and I just bought a condo down on the beach, only twenty kilometers away. Do you know how long I waited for one of those properties to free up? Do you realize what the real estate market is like on Britannia? Beach properties 
have a ten-year waiting list at least. It's insane, Christian. They tried to charge me over Shelby. He wasn't buying her change of subject. We need you. I need me. My baby brother and his wife and kids need me. My students need me. United Earth needs you. No. She was done. She'd played the puppet. She'd acted the part. She'd let her military career be run and manipulated by aspiring and conspiratorial admirals, generals, and worse, unscrupulous and greedy politicians, always responding to the next politically manufactured crisis, rather than addressing the real threat. That real threat. The galaxy was an unthinkably large place, and humanity surely hadn't discovered all its perils. There were other swarms, other civilizational threats. And what had United Earth's administration and the Joint Chiefs had her do during her tenure as captain, and later as fleet admiral? Maneuvering the fleets for maximum political posturing, against the Russian Confederation, against the Caliphate, against the Chinese Intersolar Democratic Republic, against whatever internal enemy du jour the United Earth politicians wanted to impress or intimidate with a few starships. United Earth. <laughs> the administration can go to hell. Admiral Oppenheimer grunted and bent over to pick up a stray piece of chalk that had escaped her notice. A government. I'm not talking about the government, Shelby. President Quimby can go finger his own asshole for all I care. I'm talking about our civilization. The hundreds of billions of children, women, and men that call our world home. That... United Earth needs you. She sat down, flicking off her lesson plan and stared at the blank monitor screen. She'd heard it all before. It was the same speech every administration figure and every senator had thrown at her when she was fleet admiral. And the answer was still the same. No, she said, and stood back up, picked up a briefcase. She hated calling it a purse and opened the door. Find another hero, Christian. This one ship has sailed. There's one more thing, Shelby. She paused at the threshold. Yes? I understand your nephew, your brother's son, is living on San Martin. Yes, she repeated. San Martin is in the Irigoyen sector, Shelby. And Sangre de Cristo is in the San Martin system. And just two hours ago I received reports... Her stomach clenched. Danny was her brother's oldest, and had just started college on San Martin the year before. What kind of reports? IDF Intel has been trying to put the pieces together on this terrorist... incident. Fifty thousand people incinerated, and he calls it an incident. He continued. I can't go into all the details because your security clearance has lapsed, but... There's been social unrest recently on San Martin. Stuff that hasn't made it onto the news. GPC-related. Yeah, I knew that. Everyone knows that. He shrugged. But what you might not know is that IDF Intel has been tracking Danny for about a year now. Tracking Danny? Why? And three weeks ago, he disappeared. Gone. And... We have reason to suspect he might be involved in the Sangre incident. She turned and shut the door again. Impossible. Danny's a good kid. He'd never, ever get involved in anything like this. Period. Oppenheimer shrugged. I'm only passing along what I've heard. Just consider it. The Chesapeake is destroyed by an unknown enemy. Captain Diaz is dead. And just twenty light years away, in the same sector, a colony gets hit by a nuclear terrorist attack. And in the same system, you have widespread social and political unrest. The events are not obviously related, but... Well, I'll let you connect your own dots. It's your family, after all. Yes, Danny was family. And so was Diaz. Before he'd been captain, he was her XO. Damn it. Oppenheimer knew exactly how to ensnare her. Fine. Just this once, just this mission. After it's done, and we've sorted it out, I'm gone for good. 
Oppenheimer flashed a half-smile. I knew you'd come around. Good. He pulled a small data pad out of his pocket and tapped on it. Moments later, the door opened, and the officers who'd accompanied him reappeared. We've got you a ship, and the crew is mostly in place. I give you the luxury of choosing your own senior staff, your pick of anyone in IDF, of course. What old clunker of a ship did you requisition away from some hapless captain somewhere? Oppenheimer's half-smile bloomed into a full grin. Old? <laughs> Hardly. This time, Shelby, I think even you'll be impressed. If you follow Commander Yarbrough here, he'll familiarize you with the Independence. The ship name stirred a vague memory of some classified conversations long ago. Why does that sound familiar? Because IDF Engineering conceived the project under your tenure. It was, and is, highly classified. Why? Oppenheimer walked out the door, calling behind as he left. You're about to find out. Calling behind as he left. You're about to find out. Chapter 3 Oxford Novum University, Whitehaven, Britannia, Curie Building, Lecture Hall 201. If you'll follow me, ma'am, said Commander Yarbrough, holding an arm out towards the door. Proctor eyed him with unease before picking her briefcase back up and retreating out of the classroom. Yarbrough followed close behind. He was young and already struck her as hopelessly overeager. I think you'll be very pleased with what we've been doing in ship design the past few years, ma'am, he said with a bounce in his step that she found almost nauseating. I'm sure. She followed him to the shuttle parked on the landing pad and slid into the co-pilot seat next to him. We headed to Scotland Yard? she asked, referring tongue-in-cheek to the dry dock shipyards on the outskirts of town. The citizens of Whitehaven, Britannia's capital city, were known for their quirky sense of humor. No, ma'am. This ship has far too high a classification for that. We couldn't have everyone in Whitehaven look out the window and see our little bird hovering in the distance. Little bird? That's our nickname for the ISS Independence. The lead designer thought it fitting. You'll meet her soon. She'll be the chief engineer on the mission. I thought I got to choose my senior staff, said Proctor. Are we already pulling the bait and switch? Shit! Commander Yarbrough shook his head as he maneuvered the shuttle out to IDF's Whitehaven base near Scotland Yard shipyards on the outskirts of the city. No, ma'am. You're, of course, free to replace her at your whim, though I would think with her expertise in the design of the ship you might want to keep her on. The new tech we've built into her is... Well, impressive is not a terribly impressive word, but it's all I've got. They landed, debarked, and climbed aboard an orbital transfer shuttle that would take them up through the atmosphere and out to Wellington shipyards in orbit around the gas giant Calais, past the asteroid belt, just one cue jump away. As she passed through the hatch, she nearly jumped when a booming voice greeted her. Shelby! Damn good to see you! Sitting in the pilot's seat was a middle-aged man who seemed like he was stuffed into the uniform of a recently graduated cadet. In spite of the tight-fitting flight suit, his face sported a fashionable, well-groomed goatee, and, of course, a broad, friendly smile. She smiled back. "'Good to see you, too, Balsy,' she said, using his own call sign from when they'd served together on the Constitution and the Warrior. Captain Tyler Balsy Vols, though what he was doing here and not on his own ship escaped her for a split second, before she remembered his ship had been decommissioned the year before. Did Oppenheimer suck you into this, too? Suck? Hell, I asked for it. Rumor was going around last night that he was calling you back into service, and I wasn't going to let some snot-nosed kid be your cag. Proctor gaped at him. He was pushing sixty himself, and should have had a cushy desk job as a rear admiral somewhere with a beach. You're volunteering to be my commander of the air group? Do European politicians smell like cheap prostitutes? He turned in his seat to smirk at Commander Yarbrough, whose face had wrinkled up at the improper reference. Uh, that's a yes, son, they do. But you've got the rank of captain, Balsy, which made it a whole lot easier to pull the strings necessary to get here. Hold on. 
he added as he pushed the accelerator to maximum. The buildings flew past in a blur. Captain Vols, please keep the flight parameters within normal range, said Commander Yarbrough, gripping his armrests. Kindly unclench your sphincter, Commander. I've been flying one of these things since before you were born. He angled the nose skyward, and the shuttle leapt through the clouds. Proctor smiled. Tyler Valls was one of the senior staff she would have chosen anyway, if she'd known he'd say yes. As deeply uneasy as she felt about this mission, having him along took the edge off her apprehension. So, tell me, Commander Yabro, what kind of new tech does this baby have? she said. Yobro nervously tightened his seat restraint as the craft blazed up towards the atmosphere. Oh, we've various new offensive and defensive capabilities, as well as a new experimental propulsion system. We call it transquantum jump technology. Basically lets us do an unusually long standard Q-jump about fifty times as far. Proctor puffed out a surprised breath. Five light years per jump. Holy shit. Yabra nodded solemnly. Indeed. I've been doing preliminary tests with the skeleton crew we have aboard. Our navigator calls them tranny jumps, though I've asked her repeatedly to stop, he added with a pained expression. Apparently the schoolyard humor was wasted on him, though. Proctor smiled on the inside at the term. Tranny jump. Best not to say that one in front of Oppenheimer. Tranny jumps. Balsey smirked. I'll have to remember that one. Yabro fiddled with the co-pilot controls in an attempt to compensate for Captain Valls's gut-churning maneuvers through the atmosphere. The old fighter pilot simply couldn't help himself as he spiraled them up to space. I've devoted quite a bit of thought to this, actually. At first I thought we could stick with Q-jumps for continuity's sake, but then I leaned toward T-jumps for disambiguation. But once I realized that T-jumps could be confused with transmission dumps from the comm station, T-dumps, I came up with QT-jumps. Cutie jumps? Valls made a face. Yabro shrugged. But then I decided a more formal approach might be needed, so I came up with a list of possibilities that might... Proctor rolled her eyes. This commander certainly dotted his eyes. We'll just stick with T-jumps, commander. She watched out the viewport in front of them as the atmosphere blazed past. Yabro had engaged the inertial cancelers. She was pleasantly surprised. Inertial canceller technology must have also improved since she resigned from IDF, as the turbulence during their ascent was hardly noticeable. How big is this beauty, anyway? Balsey smirked again. That's what she said. You never grew up, did you? Proctor feigned a frown, but truth be told, she missed the banter, the crude jokes, and the joy of serving with fellow irreverent officers in spite of having her strings constantly pulled, yanked usually, by top brass and politicians. Academia never filled that void for her. How could it? Now why the hell would I want to do that? Commander Yarbrough pulled out a small data pad, unfolded it, and started reading. Five hundred and one meters long, powered by a fifty terawatt direct injection dual fusion antimatter plant. Central computer is infinitely cored and non-localized, and distributed throughout the walls and decks of the ship. Standard propulsion is rated at over 10 Gs, with quad-stabilized and phase-shifted graviton-emitting inertial cancelers. The tranny drive's cap banks recharge in under a minute, enabling the maximum long-range cruising rate of over 300 light-years an hour, and over 50... Proctor held up a hand. 300 light-years per hour? That gets us to the edge of known space in less than two hours. Yes, ma'am. Like I said, it's highly classified. IDF has been sitting on this tech for three years now and is eager that it not become common knowledge quite yet. Proctor did the math and figured they could get the independence to the Irigoyen sector in less than ten minutes. Hell, this thing is on as soon as I gather my crew. As if on cue, Valls announced, Hold tight, boys and girls, we're about to make the queue jump to Calais. A few seconds later, he pressed the initiator button, and the view out the windows suddenly changed, from the blue-tinged atmosphere of Britannia to the red and orange-dappled clouds of Calais, one of the Britannia system's two gas giants. A few dozen kilometers away floated Wellington shipyards, 
where dozens of ships in various stages of assembly or maintenance were connected to giant, sweeping construction nacelles. It had been mostly destroyed during the Second Swarm War, but in a fit of post-war construction, IDF had rebuilt her, even larger than the first, keeping with humanity's defiantly stubborn tradition of, you knock down my toy, I build an even bigger toy. Tucked underneath one of the nacelles, like a little bird nestled under its mother's wing, was a ship unlike any Proctor had seen. While the old legacy fleet ships she'd served on during the last half of her military career were old, bulky, and built for punishing combat, this one seemed like a work of art. There she is, Admiral, said Yarrow. Ready to leave space dock at your command. Valls whistled. She's a beauty, all right. Nothing like the clunkers we're used to. Then again, those old clunkers saved our lives more times than I can count. You sure this thing is up to it? Any tricks up her sleeve? And after over an hour of constant frowns, furrowed brows, and worried consternation, Yabro finally smiled. You'll see. Yabro finally smiled. You'll see. Chapter 4 Irigoyen Sector Bolivar System Bolivar Watchdog Station, High Orbit Lieutenant Ethan Civic knew, beyond a doubt, that his posting aboard the defensive platform Watchdog over the far-flung colony world of Bolivar was a punishment. Retaliation for insubordination. Well, insubordination in the eyes of his former dickweed of a commander. In essence, all he'd done was tell the truth. That uniform does make you look fat, ma'am. That was all he'd said. Was there anything wrong with that? She'd asked him for his unvarnished truthful opinion, and he'd given it. Sure, it could have been the time he'd shown up drunk for duty, but it seemed like half the officers on the Farragut did that anyway. The XO was a fat, bastard, fluff-coke addict herself, so she tended to look the other way with the sorts of violations that would make her a hypocrite if she called her crew on them. But insulting her appearance, even when she looked like a massive, overgrown, stoned toad? Heresy. He pressed a few buttons, on mental autopilot, running through the regular hourly sensor scans that would ostensibly warn him of any unexpected ships in the vicinity of Bolivar. Due to the recent emergency on Sangre de Cristo, and the even more recent disappearance of the Chesapeake about ten light-years away, he even paid some attention to the scans. Usually he played solitaire, or Jack's doozies, while the scans came in, confirming the negative reading by the soft beep that always accompanied the lack of any intruders. Intruders? Huh. It had been years, decades, since there had been any intruders. The swarm was dead. The Russian Confederation had withdrawn into a state of inward-looking hermitage. The Caliphate had elected a mullah that, for once, was preaching not only peaceful coexistence, but cooperation with United Earth. And the Chinese Intersolar Democratic Republic, as usual, only wanted to profit from the West. But profit peacefully. War was bad for business. Unless that business was armament and ships, in which case the CIDR profited almost as handsomely as when there was peace. He looked out the window, and fell out of his chair. He never usually fell out of his chair, at least not while sober, but even so he found himself on the floor. He tried to leap to his feet so fast that his knees had collided with the cramped console in front of him and sent him sprawling down again, painfully. Emergency action, he called upward towards the autocom. Defensive ops on full alert, intruder approaching. Why hadn't he heard anything? If the scan came back clean, there would have been the usual beep. If the scan came back with a contact, there would have been a raucous klaxon, just like in drills. He'd have to have a stern talking to with the boys down in maintenance. To his eyes, the ship was nothing much to look at. Bulky, but with no discernible surface features indicating weaponry, covered with small, pod-like protrusions. But an intruder was an intruder. He'd received no notice from IDF to expect any unknown ships or foreign vessels. So, that made this a red alert event. Except all he wanted to do was drink. 
A lot. He reached down to his knee, fumbling with the top of his boot, loosening the strap and reaching inside for the small flask just below his knee. He usually never started drinking until just before getting off duty, but today was special. Why it was special, he couldn't fathom. It just felt special, damn it. And everyone knows you drink on special days. The little ship erupted with a red beam which pierced the defensive platform. Well, that's a problem, he thought, and seriously considered getting on the comm to alert the magrail crews. Instead, he tipped the flask back and downed the whole thing. Damn, I need more of this shit. The door to his little command center burst open and Commander Dipshit strode through. At least that was what Civic called him in his mind. His mustache bounced up and down when he walked and his comb-over tended to stick upright when he was agitated. And now was one of those comb-over erection moments. He supposed the ship firing at them was the cause. But was it really something to let one's comb-over stick up like that? Honestly, he looked like he should be driving an old-style darkened window hover van past a school, slowly, waving candy out the window. What the hell is going on, Civic? Why weren't we warned? Blow it out your hole. He stifled the rude response, allowing a slightly less rude retort to come out in its place. Seriously, sir, do I have to do everything around here? Part of him couldn't believe his ears. Was he really saying that? What the hell was he doing? The other part of him laughed like a twelve-year-old boy and wanted to add a boob joke, just for good measure. Honestly, the commander's man-boobs jiggled with every step. It was hysterically funny, especially when combined with the comb-over erection and the flop sweat. The commander stopped in his tracks. He looked conflicted, alternating between a face that wanted to clock his subordinate and a face that was absolutely, utterly bewildered. Thankfully, the bewilderment won out. Something's off, Civic. Can you feel it? Feel it? Are you asking me to fondle your balls again? Because that look on your face tells me shut the hell up, Lieutenant, and listen. Civic forced himself to bottle up the next adolescent comment and calm his breathing to the point that he could hear. Shouting. Screaming. Laughing. Somewhere down the hall, someone was having an amazing party. Or a bloody-fisted death match. Whatever it was, it was loud. The commander swore. Can't you feel that? The man's hands shook and his eyes grew wide. He flexed his fingers into white-knuckled fists. Under his breath, barely audible to Civic, he muttered a foreign-sounding word and crossed himself. Gogothica. Huh? And what the hell was the guy doing crossing himself? Had he always been religious? The laughs and screams down the hall sounded out even louder. And why they're partying while we're being fired at is beyond me, Pat. Patsy. Can I call you Patsy? A fist sucker-punched Civic across the face, and his mouth filled with blood. Shit. Am I going to take this? Time to muster up, Ethan. As soon as I find that next drink. Commander Flopsweat, rather than swing a second punch, leaned over the console, pressing the all-station comm button. All hands, this is Commander Smith. Fight it, people. You know what I mean. You feel it. The voice is telling you to do... things, things that you know you shouldn't. Fight it. That's an order. Do your duty. Or... Or I'll come and beat the shit out of each of you, Smith out. The voices. The hell was the man talking about? Damn it, things always made more sense when he'd gotten a few bottles down. Where did I put that second one? He fumbled at his other boot, but another voice in his head, a more reasonable-sounding, boring voice, said there was truth in his commanding officer's warning. He was not feeling normal. In fact, he was pulled in two directions. Half of him wanted to spring into action, be the hero, pulverize the alien ship, save the day. The other half wanted to knee his commander in the balls, take another swig from his flask, and go join the party down the hall. Lieutenant Civic, if you don't start issuing orders to return fire, I'll send you to the brig, said Commander Comb over Erection. His jaw trembled, as if he were only just barely containing his rage. Civic toyed with the idea of cajoling the man further, payback for the sucker punch. But a moment later he realized how irrational that was. After all, 
They were being fired upon by an alien ship. Holy shit, an alien ship! Commander Potbelly continued, his trembling subsided. It appeared he'd gotten control of himself. Perfect opportunity to throw another ball joke his way. And issue a distress call. Tell IDF CENTCOM we're under attack. At the window, the little ship continued firing, advancing on the watchdog until it was just a few kilometers away. Then it unleashed hell. And Civic, in spite of the oncoming storm, continued fumbling with the clasp at the top of the other boot. There it is, he thought, finding the second flask. He'd need it to cope with what he could see coming towards the station. To cope with what he could see coming towards the station. Chapter 5 Wellington Shipyards, Calais, Britannia System Conference Room, ISS Independence Four hours after she had boarded the Independence, Admiral Proctor stood at the head of the conference table. For her it was one o'clock in the morning, but on ship's time it was only the second hour of the second shift, so she'd need to stay up for several more hours at least, and she felt it. She hadn't had to pull an all-nighter since she was a captain. Damn, I'm getting old. Thank you all for coming. For some of you, this was a long trip. Believe me, I was hoping to enjoy my retirement and my classroom in peace, until I became so old and accumulated so many cats that they'd have me committed. Uneasy chuckling around the table. They all knew why they were here, and most of them, having fought through the Second Swarm War thirty years ago, knew all too well what could be coming. First, some brief introductions. She held up a hand to the gray-haired man next to her. Captain Prucha will be my XO for this mission. Admiral, began Commander Yarbrough. Far be it from me to take issue with your personnel assignments, but wouldn't it be more prudent to have someone who was intimately familiar with this new ship and the crew as our XO? Proctor looked daggers at him. Yes, Commander, you're right about one thing. Far be it from you to take issue with my personnel assignments. Some of her old hands around the table chuckled. The chief engineer clucked her tongue several times. Yabro, however, continued undeterred. At least he was persistent, she could give him that. But, Admiral, IDF regulations clearly state that the choice of XO is to be guided primarily by— She turned to him, letting a sharp note tinge her voice. The regulations clearly state, Commander, that the prerogative lies with the commanding officer as to who she wants in which position. End of story. Yarbrough's mouth abruptly shut, and he shrugged his reluctant agreement. However, she continued, I want you as the assistant XO, since, as you rightly point out, you've been with the crew since they were assigned and know the ship inside and out. That seemed to placate him. Good. The last thing I need is an uppity commander questioning my every move. Captain Prucha has graciously agreed to return early from his sabbatical, I believe you have a ship of your own waiting for you, don't you, Jeremy? He flashed one of his easy smiles she always remembered him for. The Forester, yes. New heavy cruiser they just finished out at Omaha Shipyards on Earth. But how could I turn down one last mission with the legend herself? She smirked uneasily. Flattery will get you everywhere, Captain. Or it may just get you airlocked, depends on my mood. She turned to the other end of the table. I believe you all know the Chief Engineer who apparently designed the ship from scratch. She indicated the mousy, purple-haired woman seated at the other end, who flapped a wrinkled hand up in greeting to everyone. Commander Raina Scott. Raina, how the hell is it that you're not a captain yet? You're as old as I am. Because I don't want to, came the gruff reply. Proctor shrugged. Fair enough. The chief engineer glanced at the rest of the senior staff. And call me Commander Raina. Or Granny Raina, or just Raina, unless you don't mind an occasional blunt hydra wrench to your face. Commander Yabro raised a tentative hand. But regulation clearly states that you can shove your regulations up your skinny ass, Yabra. Raina cackled. I've been around the bend enough times to be called whatever the hell I want. So unless you want me calling you Commander Rectum for the rest of the mission, 
I suggest you stop quoting regulations at me. Commander Valls, who'd been sitting silently next to Commander Scott the entire time, put an arm around her. I think I like her, Admiral. Can I keep her? Everyone chuckled. Valls and Reyna had been close since their days on the Chesapeake over twenty years prior. You all know Captain Valls, or Ballsy as his friends call him. He'll be CAG, though I'm hoping this mission will not involve any fighter battles. Valls shrugged and his goatee wrinkled. No fighter battles. We gotta have some fun, Admiral. All work and no play makes Ballsy a dull boy. Captain Prucha struck his thumb over at Valls. Something tells me that Ballsy will find a way to make this interesting, whether we want him to or not. Let's not forget the little incident during the Battle of Mao Prime. Hey, I swear, those holes in the ISS Lincoln were already there, Reyna snickered. Oh, are we calling that an incident now? That's not what they called it at your court-martial. I believe old General Norton, God rest his cantankerous soul, called it ass-hattery of the highest caliber people. Please, said Edmo Proctor, holding up her hands. The underlying tension they all felt from the emergency returned. As much as I'd enjoy catching up on old times, we've got a serious situation here. She finished out the introductions. Lieutenant Jerusha Whitehorse as the tactical crew chief. Ensign Annie Risa as helm crew leader. Polyglot Lieutenant Quirty at the comm. He tipped an imaginary hat. And Science Chief Commander Mumford, who would have looked like a heavyweight boxer were it not for the old-fashioned black plastic-rimmed glasses on his nose. Balsey interrupted her. Didn't you used to be a boxer, Commander Mumford? I did. Proctor raised her eyebrows. She hadn't expected her guest to have been right. Really? What brought you to the dock side? Science doesn't pay nearly as well as professional sports. I like beating the shit out of things, he said, nodding as if that explained everything. He pushed his glasses back up after they slipped a bit. They all stared at him. Nothing beats science. He shrugged, still clearly thinking that explained everything. Indeed, she said, letting the subject rest. You all know why we're here. We've got a situation in the Irigoyen sector, and it doesn't look pretty. As we speak, Fleet Admiral Oppenheimer is on Britannia preparing the main IDF defense fleet for major combat operations. But we're being sent in as soon as possible to gather intel, scout out the enemy— and hopefully stop it before it can do any more damage. Captain Prucha stirred. What kind of damage are we looking at here? The entire world of Irigoyen Prime has gone dark. All communications are out. No ships out of the system since yesterday morning. We've also got spotty intel from the Dolmasi. Turns out they've lost a few colonies, and if reports can be believed, Verdra Dol has gone dark as well. Verdra Dol? Isn't that the closest thing to a home world that they've got? said Captain Prucha. It's their second most populous world, yes, replied Proctor. And the latest intel report from Oppenheimer came in just a few minutes ago. Bolivar, the second largest world in the Irigoyen sector, reported sighting an unknown vessel entering the system just a few hours ago. Since then, nothing. Not a single metaspace signal has gotten through. Silence around the conference table as they all considered the gravity of the situation. Not a single message? From the entire world? The orbital defense platform? said Captain Valls. Captain Prucha whistled. That must be some ship. Reminds me of the swarm when they first attacked thirty years ago. Remember the first incursions? All the systems went dark. They were able to disrupt all communications with their Russian-borrowed singularity tech. Are we certain this threat is not the swarm? Proctor shook her head. She almost wished it was the swarm. At least that was an enemy she knew how to deal with, as deadly as they were. But she'd led the mission that had destroyed the last known swarm carrier twenty-five years ago, effectively putting an end to their entire race. A whole species, gone with the press of a button. The war had been over for years, and the remaining swarm carriers were mostly dormant, since Granger had closed the black hole they were being controlled through. But still, CENTCOM had insisted that each remaining carrier be utterly destroyed. So she destroyed. No, 
The threat signature doesn't match anything we ever saw from them. This is new, as far as we can tell. The ship description is unlike anything we've seen. Their tech, what little we know about it, is advanced, and the worst part might be something we've never encountered before. She glanced over at Commander Mumford. He cleared his throat. Before Irigoyen Prime went dark, there were widespread reports of civil unrest in the cities. Which cities? said Captain Prucha. Mumford shrugged. All of them. Fighting, arson, murders. It was like the entire surface just went up in the flames of riots and thuggery just before the unknown ship struck. And once it struck, that was the last we heard. Admiral Proctor nodded and continued for him. We've hypothesized that the aliens are using some sort of EM wave, possibly metaspace-enhanced, that somehow influences organic neural pathways and brain chemical structure, inducing some kind of psychotropic response. Proctor looked around at all their faces and saw understanding suddenly dawn on them. The unasked question had probably been nagging them the entire time she knew. Why her? Why turn to the ousted former fleet admiral, who was happily spending her retirement in the classroom and on the beach? Yes, that is the main reason they called me up. Due to my extensive experience studying xenobiology and my years of direct interaction with all things Swarm, Dolmasi, Sciora, and every other alien race we've encountered. Reyna muttered, Like hell, Captain. They're calling you up for more than that. You're a goddamn hero. The closest thing United Earth has to one, if you don't mind my truth speaking. Proctor smiled but held up a hand. Thank you, Reyna. But we all know that all the heroes are dead, she replied using an off-quoted aphorism of the Second Swarm War. They died saving Earth last time around. I'm just a gal that knows a thing or two about commanding a starship and a little extra experience dealing with aliens. Tim Granger was the real hero. God rest his soul. Her staff, old faces and new, beamed back at her. Many of them had been to hell and back at her side. As for the others... She assumed Admiral Oppenheimer had given her the best of the best. We T-jump out within the hour. I want final readiness reports in thirty. Dismissed. Don't you mean tranny jump? Said Valls with a lopsided grin. I mean, let's call it what it— Admiral Proctor, Bridge. The calm interrupted him. Proctor touched the glowing indicator on the conference table. Go ahead, Bridge. Sir, we've just received a metaspace distress call from Orbital Defense Platform Watchdog Orbiting Bolivar— they say they've, and I quote, engaged the Golgothics. It's not entirely clear what they mean by that, Admiral. So, the Bolivarans have given the aliens a name already? Golgothics? Lieutenant Corty, his voice tinged by a heavy southern drawl, raised a finger. May I, if I may? Grew up on Bolivar myself. Old Bolivaran legend, or rather a campfire story you'd tell to scare the pants off each other. They're supposed to be a race of unholy terrors that make you feel your worst emotions, all multiplied and enhanced till you're good right batty. Eat your supper or the Golgothics will eat you, my grandmam always said. Of course, she was half coon crazy herself. Proctor snorted. That name will do for now, I suppose. She raised her head toward the calm. Thank you, Bridge. She eyed them all. Let's move. She eyed them all. Let's move. Chapter 6 Britannia System, Calais, Wellington Shipyards, Bridge, ISS Independence. T jump in five, ma'am, said Ensign Risa. Proctor gripped her armrests in preparation. She had no reason to assume the T jump would be qualitatively any different than the Q jump which was basically undetectable to the senses, but her careful instincts set her on edge. Initiating. The view on the screen covering the front half of the bridge shifted from a serene display of the giant red clouds of Calais to a star-speckled canvas of black, open interstellar space. It had been years since Proctor had seen it and had almost forgotten how free it felt. It reminded her of how sea captains must have felt as they lost all sight of land 
seeing only the unending swell of distant waves. Proctor's ears popped. The hell was that? She craned her neck around to look at Commander Yarbrough. Normal, ma'am. The T-jump is a bit more... intense than the Q-jump. We did just travel five light years, after all. Proctor opened and closed her jaw to relieve the pressure differential. But why the pressure change? Just an artifact of the T-jump process. Due to the extreme distance involved, the less dense matter arrives first, in our case the atmosphere, just a fraction of a fraction of a second. But the individual speeds of the air molecules are high enough that when the rest of us appear, the internal ship pressure has dropped by a small amount. Proctor glanced at Science Chief Mumford, who shrugged. Well, that's... unnerving, she said. There's no chance things could get out of hand and we suddenly lose all pressure on one of these jumps. Commander Yarbrough shook his head. No, sir. We've run the numbers on our T-jump simulations for years, and the chances of that happening are less than five sigmas of standard deviation from the mean. If you'd like, I can run a few additional Monte Carlo simulations and determine a better regression. Thank you, Commander, she said, cutting him off. She remembered being a little uptight herself back when she was a fresh Commander, seeking to stand out, but she already found his eager-to-please attitude tiresome. Let's focus on the emergency at hand. She turned back to Ensign Risa. Time until next queue jump. Just a few seconds, sir. The same unnerving feeling washed over Proctor as her ears popped, and the star field on the screen shifted almost imperceptibly. Not sure I'm going to get used to that. The jumps ticked by, and within ten minutes Ensign Risa announced, Last T-jump. Proctor nodded. All hands to battle stations. Sound red alert. She motioned over to Captain Prucha to begin battle readiness operations. Magrel stations commence loading operations. Laser turret crews prime initiators and start auto-targeting sequences. Emergency crews. Stand by to prepare for damage control and casualties. He went down his readiness checklist while Proctor clicked the comm over to the CIC on the fighter deck. Balzi? Everything ready down there? Yes, ma'am. Got a pretty green crew down here, but the squad leaders are veterans, at least. No one has seen actual combat. Except me, of course. He added offhandedly. I would have thought that with a new experimental starship, we'd get new experimental fighters. Problem? Not at all. These old Dex 25s are solid workhorses. I wouldn't ask for anything more. Just let me know the plan when we get there, Shelby. Stand by, Balzi. One T jump left. Have all fighters ready to launch. All stations report ready, Admiral, said Captain Prucha. She nodded. The old, swelling feeling of pre-battle adrenaline surged into her chest. This was the part of command that she both hated and missed. The feeling of urgency and clarity that preceded an impending battle. The awful feeling that some of them might die, that she might lose people under her command. But it was invigorating, nonetheless. Nothing in academia or the rest of her experience came close to replicating the feeling. It was like a drug. She felt guilty for enjoying, yet looked forward to the next fix. Initiate final T-jump. The screen shifted, and in place of a brilliant star field, appeared a blue and white dappled world, with a strike terminator separating night and day on the surface. Bolivar. And on the night side of the planet... The surface burned. Night side of the planet. The surface burned. Chapter 7 Irigoyen Sector. Bolivar System. Bolivar. Bridge. ISS Independence. Something inside her snapped. Something latent and visceral. Proctor gasped. For the briefest moment, images of scores of eviscerated Skiora flashed before her eyes, their small, alien blue bodies torn, their thousands of embryos stored within their bodies oozing red blood, as if she were momentarily transported to a waking nightmare. But the next moment her vision snapped back to the rising smoke plumes on the planet below. What the hell was that? She turned to the tactical crew. Lieutenant Whitehorse, scan the surface. What the hell are we seeing? Something odd about the woman. 
The tactical officer was staring at her console, her face muscles occasionally making twitching or jerking motions, as if she were having a minor seizure. Lieutenant, she repeated. Whitehorse shook her head. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. The officer focused on her data console, her face still screwed up as if in intense concentration. But she finally shook herself out of whatever had come over her. Widespread fires on the surface, mainly from the densely populated areas, the cities, towns, anywhere with a high concentration of people. Lots of fires. Some have spread to the forests. Why? No idea, ma'am. She turned back to the view screen covering the front of the bridge. The fires themselves weren't actually visible on the day side of the Terminator, since they were orbiting over five hundred kilometers above the surface, but the sight of the giant plumes of smoke rising from the cities was disturbing, to say the least. And she couldn't shake the overwhelming feeling of... What the hell was she feeling? Fear? Anger? Something inside of her was writhing, raging, seething to the surface, making her either want to lash out or run or both. She balled her fists and bit her lip in an attempt to ground herself. Scan all orbits. Search for the alien vessel. Scanning, said Whitehorse. She reached up and scratched furiously at the back of her neck. Proctor could see the hand shake. Damn, they could all feel it, too. Something was wrong. Proctor wheeled around to face Commander Yarbrough. Now's the time, Commander. Where the hell are all the new-fangled defensive capabilities you were talking about? Admiral? The men looked puzzled. We're being hit with... something. It's affecting our brain chemistry, can't you feel it? Yarbro paused, looking down at his arms as if in a moment of introspection. I suppose I could catalog my feelings and compare them to prior baseline feelings, though I haven't been as diligent at cataloging my feelings lately. Proctor couldn't tell if the man was joking or not. Yarbrough hadn't seemed like the type to ever kid, and so the remark made even less sense. Whatever the aliens or Golgothics were hitting them with, it was clearly affecting him, too. His eyes darted back and forth over his handheld data pad, and he spoke almost twice as fast as he usually did. I suppose if I tapped into the ship's medical logs and compiled a spreadsheet at baseline neurotransmitter levels and kept a running log of Commander, snap out of it! We need to block this, whatever it is. What can the independence do for us? Yarbrough's eyes continued darting back and forth, and he was at a loss for words. Flustered, Proctor spun around to the comm station. Ensign Quirty, Billy Bob, interrupted the man. Proctor closed her eyes in annoyance and struggled not to lash out. Surely that was a normal response to the officer's breach of decorum. Ensign... Billy Bob Quirty, are you reading anything on regular channels? No, ma'am, he began, his voice heavily tinged by a deep American South accent. He was either from Ganymede or Alabama. All the calm channels quieter than a hibernating coon. Broaden the spectrum. Look at the whole band. Adjust harmonics to look for metaspace carrier frequencies. Yes, am Any idea what I'm looking for, Admiral? He twanged. At least his fingers were dancing deftly over the console. Anything. She had to keep herself from rolling her eyes. Commander Yarbrough had assured her that Ensign Quirty was the best of the best. Polyglot, linguist, a virtual communication genius. But all she could see and hear was a redneck and... Was that... Chew bulging in his cheek? Shit. Before she lashed out at him, was that a normal feeling? She turned to Mumford, the boxer-turned-science chief. Can we disrupt it, whatever it is? He shrugged, his massive shoulders bouncing up, mirrored by his eyebrows. We can't block it if we don't even know what it is. We could try the new anti-laser EM shielding, said Yarbrough, apparently in a moment of clarity. Though I'd be more comfortable if I could compile a list of failure modes and run a few Monte Carlo simulations on it, Proctor snapped her finger. She remembered the new shielding back from her days as Fleet Admiral of IDF. In fact, if she remembered correctly, the signature authorizing the release of funding for the project was hers. The research and deployment must have finally happened. Brilliant, she said, cutting Yarbrough off and pointing to Mumford. Could it work? 
I mean, assuming this signal, whatever it is, is EM-based. Mumford, in spite of being the science chief, was built like a bull. His shoulders heaved as he lifted his hands to his terminal. Damn, why was she so fixated on those shoulders? Those huge, meaty shoulders rippling like... Yarbrough kept right on speaking, not even giving Mumford the chance to reply, his mousy features and flimsy mustache reminding Proctor of some old television caricature of a dopey, nameless worrywart. Someone who usually ate it when the monster or the alien or the big bad showed up. Admiral, I strongly protest. If we want to use the EM shielding for something other than its intended purpose, we need to run tests. We need benchmarks, baselines, error analysis. We can't get sloppy, especially now with our lives on the line. Proctor just stared at him. What the hell was he talking about? Running engineering tests now? In the middle of a red alert, all hands to battle station situation? She shook her head and glanced back at Mumford, who was himself looking skeptically, scornfully, at Yarbrough, his broad shoulders bulging underneath the too tight uniform. Shit, they were all going crazy, herself included. But no, not exactly crazy, just exaggerated. Whatever this was, it seemed to be amplifying whatever their basest and most fundamental mental processes were compelling them to do, amplifying and hyperbolizing their thoughts. For Yarbrough, it was amplifying his urge to cross the T's and dot the I's, to proceed with maximum safety, to understand whatever threat they faced in gory, unnecessary detail. For Mumford, well, who knew what he was feeling? He seemed to be acting very hesitantly, at least in spite of those beefcake shoulders, while Proctor herself seemed overly focused on doing something, anything. But that was rational, right? Was that her only tick? The doing something? And the shoulders? A voice came from right behind her. Captain Prucha had crept over to the captain's chair and spoke near her ear. We need to get the hell out of here. Now! Leave? She turned to face him. Are you suggesting we just turn tail and run? We're supposed to be the rescuers, remember? Prucha's face was tightening by the second. His brow furrowed more than she'd ever seen it. He seemed on the verge of screaming at her. We can't be the rescuers if we go crazy, Shelby. Our ability to render aid is severely curtailed if we can't even trust our own judgment skills. But we're all these people have. His eyes twitched even more. We are steering the most advanced warship humanity has ever known towards one of the most populated planets in United Earth space. Do we really want our twitchy fingers on the triggers of these new weapons? He had a point. And the overwhelming feelings she and all of them were experiencing could just be the tip of the iceberg. Judging from the thousands of fires ravaging the surface, things could get a whole lot worse. On the other hand, they had to do something. They had a mission. They were people to save, a planet to save, hell, a civilization to save. If what she was seeing down on the surface was all caused by the alien ship, then this was not only a threat, but an existential threat. Any progress locking down that signal spectrum, she said to no one in particular while she watched the surface burn. No, ma'am, said Lieutenant Whitehorse as a new alarm sounded in the background. But now reading a sensor contact coming on fast. She looked up, her face flushed red probably from holding in an outburst of some kind. It's the alien ship. It'll be here in two minutes. Ship. It'll be here in two minutes. Chapter 8 Irigoyen Sector, Bolivar System, Bolivar, Watchdog Station, High Orbit When Lieutenant Civic woke up, he wished he hadn't. His head throbbed. He had no idea why, though as he lifted his head from the deck plate, his cheek stuck to the surface. A probing finger revealed his face was covered in blood. Likely his head, too, if the pain back there was any indication. A glance to his left told him that Commander Smith had fared worse. A hole where his face had been didn't bode well for the man's health. That shouldn't be there, he mumbled 
gaping at the bloody space where Smith's nose, skull, and brain should have been. The gore still hadn't registered as something real to his mind. It was like watching a movie. He knew he should be repulsed. He knew he should be doubled over and vomiting at the sight of the gruesome scene. But all he could think about was trying to remember what was going on. He tried to remember what had happened before he blacked out, but failed. There was a battle. Weapons fire. With whom? His head hurt too badly to remember. Klaxons, alarms, shouting. Everything in the background was chaos. Was the battle still going on? Groaning, he pushed himself to his knees and tried to stand. As he swayed, he caught sight of a hole in the bulkhead, about the same size as the hole in Smith's face. A shimmering field covered the opening, an emergency measure to prevent the loss of atmosphere. But emergency hull containment fields were energy-intensive, and if it wasn't physically patched soon, the field would fail and expose the room to vacuum. At that thought, the room spun and he doubled over again, vomiting all over his boots. He glanced to his left at the gory sight of Smith's former face and felt his mouth water again, before another fit of vomiting overtook him. Reality was starting to set in. The foul aroma of alcohol and stomach acid assaulted his nose and pierced the hazy veil over his memory. He'd been drinking. Heavily. And he was starting to remember why. The ship. He jumped to his feet, suppressing another wave of nausea, and slid into his chair at the command station. Where was the ship? A quick glance over the sensor data revealed no unknown contacts within hundreds of kilometers, just a few hundred ships over Bolivar in various stages of falling through the atmosphere. Merchant freighters, cargo carriers, military patrol ships, colonial transports, all of them, almost every single one, either burned through the atmosphere or were falling quickly towards it. A few lucky ships appeared to be in stable orbits around Bolivar, along with Watchdog Station. The planet wasn't faring any better than the ships. Smoke billowed up from the major towns, dozens of kilometers into the atmosphere, some forming great mushroom clouds, as if nuclear explosions had flattened entire cities. Did the governments of Bolivar have secret tactical nukes? Or were those from the alien ship? Where the hell was that ship? He tapped into the planetary sensor network, giving him access to data from the other side of the planet, and, sure enough, a weather satellite confirmed the presence of the unknown vessel orbiting slowly. The defensive satellites seemed to be all knocked out or disabled. The ship seemed to glide right on by, without a single defensive shot from the defense network. It was headed towards another ship, an IDF ship, one he didn't recognize. He keyed in a command to read the ship's transponder, ISS Independence. Never heard of it. He shook his head. The earlier conflicting emotions had subsided. Fear still threatened to paralyze him, and the urge to lick her up still gnawed at him, but for the most part, his head was clear. Did those feelings... Did they come from that alien ship? Luckily, it was on the other side of the planet now. The sensor readout changed. Something was happening. The distinct signature of weapons fire, though he couldn't tell who was shooting. Perhaps both the Independence and the alien ship. All he knew was that the power readings from the Independence were starting to fluctuate. Shit, they needed help. Otherwise, they'd end up just like Watchdog Station, broken and bleeding. As if to punctuate his thought, another klaxon sounded in the distance another hull breach. The energy field over the hole in the bulkhead nearby started to shimmer and fluctuate. If there were more of those holes in other parts of the station, say a few dozen, then the power draw to maintain atmospheric integrity would be substantial. And a quick glance at the operations console monitor nearby told him even more bad news. The station's reactor was going critical. Whereas before he was worried that they'd be dead within the hour, now he knew he had only a few minutes if he was going to do anything at all. And from the station he could do very little. It was really only one choice at this point, and though it was the one choice he dreaded. But given the alternative, it was all he had. He hadn't flown a ship for over a year. He'd sworn he wouldn't ever again. 
Watchdog Station had a handful of fighters stationed in its bay, and a quick glance at another readout on his console told him that all of them were disabled, except for two. The rest had holes in them the same size as the hole in Smith's face. In fact, the entire bay was at vacuum. The fighter pilots on standby could be dead for all he knew. His stomach seemed to lurch into his mouth and his head spun again, though at the sight of a coffee mug flying past his face, he knew this wasn't just his queasiness again. Artificial gravity was out. The rest of life support would probably soon follow. If he was going to do this, it had to be now. Launching himself out of his seat, he swore as he collided with the ceiling. Damn it! His zero-G training certification had lapsed earlier in the year. He hated zero-G. He hated all Gs that weren't regular G. It was part of why he'd turned in his fighter pilot wings a year ago, much to the chagrin of his father. If his mother were still alive, he imagined she'd kick his ass. Flying fighters was in his blood. It was his heritage. It was the family business, it seemed. And he'd turned his back on it, and on his dead mother, and his living and livid father. He shook his head clear of the collision with the ceiling and pushed himself towards the door. Luckily, it sensed his impending approach and slid open at the last second, allowing him to sail through into the hallway beyond, though he needed to make a last-minute adjustment to his trajectory to avoid crashing into the limp body of Commander Smith, which had floated up along with dozens of globules of his blood. One of the floating red spheres splashed onto his shoulder as he passed, making his stomach churn again. You can do this, Civic, you can do this, Civic. He chanted to himself over and over again like a mantra. He flew down the ruined hallway, seeing an occasional hole in the floor. When he glanced up, he saw a matching hole in the ceiling. Beyond each, he could see the chaos in the deck below or above. At one, he paused to look through the oval-shaped hole, peering through at least four decks' worth of destruction, terminating in a hole of exactly the same shape in the exterior bulkhead. Stars twinkled on the other side of the shimmering blue screen. Shit, I've got no time. At the lift he pushed the call button, but nothing happened. He wondered if the lifts depended on the artificial gravity system, but even as he thought it, he realized he didn't need the lift. Keying in the emergency override code, the door slid open, but stopped halfway. With effort he managed to push it back into its sleeve, and he pulled himself into the empty elevator shaft. Luckily, the lift seemed to be stuck above him, though with the zero-G he now thought of that direction as behind him, and he sailed forward through the shaft, counting the decks down until he arrived at the fighter bay. With another override entry and more grunting, he managed to force the door open and push himself into the antechamber of the bay, which, luckily, was not at vacuum. Distant explosions punctuated his panic. Was that the core? No, if that were the core exploding, he wouldn't be here right now. Nevertheless, another explosion, this one close enough to make him instinctually cover his ears, pushed him to hurry even more. Except that wasn't an explosion. It was a gunshot. Who the hell was shooting a gun on a station whose core was about to go critical? Had that mysterious ship dropped off a boarding party? But the questions could wait for now, since shouting voices nearby made him dash for an armaments container in the corner. He yanked it open and swore under his breath. He'd been hoping to find at least a sidearm there, if not an assault rifle. It was completely empty. The voices were getting louder. With no other choices left, he pulled himself into the container and yanked the lid mostly shut, leaving just enough of a space to see out into the launch bay's anteroom. He'd hid just in time. The door into corridor slid open, and a man, handcuffed and thrashing, flew through and collided into the far wall bounced off, and drifted back towards the door. He was wearing a contractor's uniform, probably from one of the commercial vendors that regularly serviced the station. Two other men, both in IDF uniforms, appeared at the door, and as the flailing, handcuffed man sailed back towards them, one of the newcomers bashed his face with the sidearm he was holding. The handcuffed man started spinning, blood flinging off his face in all directions. Last chance, Underwood! Where is it? This is the last time I ask. The man with the gun leveled it at the bound contractor's head, who was now being held in place by the other IDF officer. Civic didn't recognize any of them, though Watchdog Station was pretty large, 
hosting over 300 IDF personnel and contractors at any given time. The contractor struggled against the handcuffs, but it was a futile effort. You people are freaks. This place is going to blow, and all you care about is the— Another blow to the face from the sidearm silenced him. Last chance. The man holding the gun checked the safety and then pointed it at the man's forehead. The other officer let go of the contractor and pushed himself away, up toward the ceiling, and then back down to the floor to float next to the officer with the gun. The contractor swore under his breath, Fine. It's already loaded onto one of the shuttles. So you lied to me earlier? The contractor was getting frantic as he watched the barrel of the gun pointed between his eyes. I had orders. You have to understand. I was just— I have orders, too. But he smiled and lowered the gun. You passed the test, my friend. I knew it was on the shuttle already. He started to push the gun into his belt, fingering the safety on. We may just take you with us. Save your life, you know. Pay you back for finally coming around to see reason. A reward, you see. The contractor breathed a little easier and nodded vigorously. I need the authorization code to open the shuttle. What is it? He peered out through the thick composite glass windows into the actual shuttle bay. And which shuttle is it? Shuttle Fenway. Code is Fenway Bravo Sholvek Orion 112. A distant explosion shook the room, and the contractor eyed the walls nervously. Please, please hurry. We've got to get out of here. The man with the gun nodded. Agreed. He pulled the gun out, flipped the safety off, and shot the contractor through the forehead. The body jerked once and started somersaulting backward, blood trailing out from the head in a spiral as the corpse slowly rotated. Let's go. The man nodded at his companion, holstered the gun, and they both sailed over to the fighter pilot's lockers, searching until they found flight suits and helmets. And bays at vacuum. Be ready for explosive decompression. Civic tried not to gasp, but he knew what was coming. And before he could even breathe deeply a few times to prepare, the whole room exploded in a rush of air as the thick doors opened into the shuttle bay. Air as the thick doors opened into the shuttle bay. Chapter 9 Irigoyen Sector Bolivar System, Bolivar Bridge, ISS, Independence It's firing at us, sir, yelled Lieutenant Whitehorse. Proctor spun around to face the screen, her eyes darting back and forth across the other vessel, searching for the expected energy beam or whatever the Golgothics used for their weapons. With what? The entire deck jolted under their feet. With that, said Whitehorse. They've got magrails, but... Holy shit! Spit it out, Lieutenant. These are magrail slugs, all right, but they're bigger than anything I've ever seen, at least a hundred kilos each and solid iron, and they're going faster than... well, anything I've ever seen, fifty kps at least. Proctor's eyes bulged. A hundred kilos accelerated up to fifty kps in the space of a few milliseconds? The power required to achieve such a feat was... formidable. Terawatts, at least. Damage! Blew a hole clean through Independence, Admiral, said Captain Prucha. Receiving reports of casualties on several decks. Hull containment is compromised, but backups are in place. It's firing again, yelled Whitehorse. The deck lurched and bucked. Proctor grabbed her chair and pulled herself into it, fastening the restraints to keep herself from flying out. For the last dozen years or so of her career as an IDF captain, she had served aboard legacy fleet ships. Constitution, Warrior, Victory, Chesapeake. Massive behemoths that didn't, couldn't, shake so much. The independence was far smaller, far lighter, and she could feel it in the tremors in the deck plate. All magrail crews, target the vessel and open fire. Laser crews, same, open the hell up on that thing. Aye, ma'am. Lieutenant Whitehorse signaled to her tactical crew, coordinating firing patterns. All magrails engaged. Lasers... She frowned. Lasers having no effect, sir. They're just bouncing right off. Proctor snapped her head towards Captain Yarbrough. You said those are terawatt lasers. They are. And how the hell can that blasted thing out there repel a terawatt beam? She watched a video feed. 
and indeed the laser beams rather than turn the other ship into glowing slag or a rapidly expanding cloud of vapor, just bounced off like the Independence with shining handheld pointer lasers at the other ship. And the Magrail slugs! She watched the video feed, but she knew she'd never see the damn things going over ten kilometers per second. They're, uh, also bouncing off, ma'am. White Horse's brow furrowed. I don't understand. They shouldn't do that. Ever. Impossible. Are the magrail calibrations off? Are they moving at the right speed? The only way a slug bounces off is if it's only moving very slowly. No, ma'am. White Horse pounded the console in frustration as another burst of slugs shot out from the independence and bounced off faster than they could see. I don't understand it, sir. It's almost like there's different physics governing that hull over there. Terawatt beams of photons and slugs of tungsten don't bounce off any surface, no matter how well engineered it is. An explosion tore through the rear of the bridge, sending Captain Prucha flying forward, along with two ops technicians. They landed in a crumpled pile after hitting the front wall. Proctor ripped the seat restraint away and ran towards them, but she could see immediately there was nothing she could do. Prucha bled profusely from his neck, and it seemed his head was only half attached. All three officers were completely scorched. Admiral Proctor's breath caught in her throat. It had been decades since she'd seen such visceral gore and violence, and with the sight of the erupting blood came the memories of the Second Swarm War, rushing back to overwhelm her. Ensign Risa, get us out of here. Ma'am? It was a retreat, but there was no choice. They'd be picked apart without so much as touching the mysterious ship. Now, any heading. Proctor supposed that the initial cancellers were damaged because she nearly fell down as the Independents started speeding away from the Golgothic ship, shooting eastward above the upper atmosphere of Bolivar. Smart move, she thought. If they were to lose engines, orbiting in the same direction as the planet's spin would make a crash landing that much easier. Pursuit! Whitehorse shook her head. None. The alien ship is proceeding along its heading, as if we'd never met it. Course? Looks like it's heading out toward Ido, Bolivar's moon. Ido? What the hell would it want with Ido? A billion people on Bolivar, and how many on Ido? She looked over to Commander Yarbrough, with her brow raised in a question. A few hundred tops. It's only used as a ship supply depot and transfer point. Proctor turned back to look at the dead Captain Prucha. They'd served for years together on the Chesapeake. He was her confidant, her rock during the most difficult days of that assignment. But she forced the tears back and swallowed the growing lump at the back of her throat. Mourn later. Survive now. At the back of her mind, she thought it was remarkable how the old survival instincts she'd developed during the Second Swarm War of thirty years ago came back so readily, like riding a bicycle except this bicycle was on fire, made of dynamite, and she was speeding over a cliff. Her ship status schematic on her command console was a sea of flashing red. Does IDF have any defense assets out at Ido? Commander Yarbrough shook his head. Barely. Just a single orbiting defense platform, a couple mag rails, crew of twenty, tops. Madam Admiral, think you should see this, ma'am. The comm chief, Lieutenant Corty, was waving her down. The urgency of the situation was exacerbating his southern twang. Picking up a shitload of comm chatter on idea frequencies. What is it? Sounds like Admiral Mullins down in CENTCOM Bolivar finally managed to muster his planetary defense fleet. They had been dispersed throughout the sector helping with relief operations for Sangre de Cristo. But there's a slight problem. What could possibly make this situation worse? I'm sure we can handle it. Corti nodded. Much of Bolivar's defense fleet has mustered at Ido to face the Golgothic ship. But well, from the sound of things, uh, several of the captains have, uh, uh, declared for the GPC and are threatening to shoot any IDF vessel that intervenes. To shoot any IDF vessel that intervenes. Chapter 10 Irigoyen Sector, Bolivar System, Ido Bridge, ISS Independence Are they crazy? 
Proctor asked, turning to look at the schematic map of the fleet layout, which showed the ships arrayed at Ido. Several of the blue icons had turned red, indicating which ones had supposedly declared for the GPC. Commander Yarbrough came up behind her. They actually could be crazy, judging from the... effects from that alien ship. I confess, when that ship was close to us, I half wanted to take over the helm and get us out of there, and... well, half wanted to grab the nearest gun and blow my own head off. I was so scared. She looked back at him and nodded. I agree. It was harrowing, but this is different. I didn't sign up to rein in a bunch of separatist malcontents. She turned back to the screen. I don't care what that alien ship is doing to their judgment. They'd better stand down now or face a very angry former fleet admiral, she added under her breath. Do we have time to babysit a bunch of scared IDF captains? Yabro asked. Or fight a civil war? Because that's what this looks like. You don't take over an IDF warship and think United Earth is going to come after you with kid gloves. She approached Ensign Risa at the helm. Get us out there. T-jump. Put us right in the middle of the ships that haven't declared for the GPC. Aye, aye, ma'am. Moments later, she felt the now familiar vertigo from the T-jump, and the view screen shifted to reveal Bolivar's planetary defense fleet, with the gray regolith of Ido behind them. Almost immediately, the earlier feelings of raw fear, rage, lust, and terror returned. A Golgothic ship was near. Open a channel to the whole fleet, she said. Cordy nodded. Open, Admiral. All IDF ships. This is Admiral Shelby Proctor, acting under the direct authority of Fleet Admiral Oppenheimer. As you're all well aware, we're under attack. She clenched her jaw, weighing her next words carefully which was ten times more difficult under the influence of the Golgothic's emotion-disrupting broadcast. I'm under the impression that several captains have chosen this moment to declare their political leanings. This is unacceptable, especially in the face of an existential threat that we face in the form of that alien ship. While we don't understand yet its intentions, I think we can assume— the calm erupted with a booming voice that interrupted her. Admiral Proctor, please spare us your speech. We've suffered under the oppressive regime of United Earth for too long to have to suffer through the empty threats of a washed-up former wannabe war hero. Proctor's face flushed red with anger. On the split screen she saw the Golgothic vessel was approaching the moon and their fleet. They had minutes at best to prepare themselves— and here she was arguing with a political idealist who was under the influence. She glanced at the fleet layout schematic and noted the captain's name and ship. Captain She, I presume. Look, Captain, we can discuss your political grievances later, but what matters now is that you bring the Davenport with us into battle with the alien ship. Our very survival depends on it. Lieutenant Whitehorse called from the tactical station. Admiral, they're arming Magrill and laser turrets. Targeting computers are locking onto us. Oh, for the love... Risa, move us away. Get us in orbit around Ido on a course that won't pass us anywhere near these assholes. She motioned towards the comm station for Quirty to open up the channel to the entire fleet. All IDF ships who are willing and able, follow the Independence to Ido to intercept the alien ship. Any IDF vessel that chooses not to engage with us will face severe repercussions when this is over. Proctor out. On the screen, the intransigent IDF vessels shrunk to small white dots as the independence accelerated away, accompanied by over half of the Bolivaran fleet. They started swinging around the moon, passing the Terminator and into the darkness of Ido's night. After a minute or so, the sense of rage and dread induced by the Golgothics dissipated to just a background murmur, like shadowy fears in the corners of her mind. Risa, increase speed to ten KPS— we're going to slingshot around the moon and hit it with a barrage of magrel slugs. She sat down in the captain's chair and fastened the restraints. Granger's favorite move, she muttered. I thought his favorite move was hurling other starships into swarm carriers, said Yarbrough. She shrugged. They did call him the bricklayer for all the bricks he sent through the swarm's windows. Starships were expendable to him. To me, they're not. She glanced up at Yarbrough. 
yet. But the memory of Granger's unorthodox tactics gave her an idea. If Captain Shee and his cohort were going to get in the way of her tactical operations... Ensign Risa, adjust our heading. Come up on the alien ship from the direction of the rebels. Reduce speed until we're right up under their noses. Ma'am, that's going to expose us to their fire, said White Horse. Yes, she said, gripping her armrests. But it will also let us use them as a shield. But it will also let us use them as a shield. Chapter 11 Irigoyen Sector, Bolivar System, Bolivar Watchdog Station, High Orbit Civic gripped the storage locker so hard that the edges dug into his palms, but mercifully the maelstrom of air, debris, and the contractor's blood ceased soon after it began, as the bay doors shut behind the two officers. He counted to ten before launching himself out of the container. The station was going to blow any second. He had to balance that impending death with the possibility of being seen by the two unknown assassins, who would surely kill any potential witnesses to their crime. What were they looking for? Why was it worth killing for? He didn't have time to think about it. He ripped one of the fighter pilot lockers open, empty, except for a few personal effects. The next three lockers also showed no signs of a flight gear, or any other kind of emergency environmental suit that would let him survive the hard vacuum of the bay. The last locker, marked Johnson, bore fruit. He wondered where Lieutenant Johnson was as he pulled the man's suit on, locking the seals in place, and struggling to squeeze into something that was obviously meant for a slightly smaller man, a situation made worse by the fact that he was floating in the air, pulling the suit on without any leverage from gravity. He ran the helmet onto his head. Stickers, insignia, and graffiti covered the exterior of the well-worn helmet, but it looked serviceable. The oxygen indicator suggested the reserves were full, and the power backups were at full charge. Thank God for the diligence of maintenance crews and Shovik Orion, military equipment supplier extraordinaire. He hadn't even locked the helmet seal in place when the pressure in the antechamber blew again, this time because of a hull containment force field that had failed. The air in the room flooded towards a hole in the wall, separating him from the bay, and any object in the room not nailed down suddenly became a deadly projectile. But projectiles weren't his immediate concern. He gasped as the air thinned and he struggled against the fierce wind to seal the helmet. At the moment, he felt like his lungs were about to burst into his mouth and his eyes pop. He managed to crank the seal shut, and the oxygen system automatically engaged, as it sensed the near-vacuum condition of the suit. That was too close, he told himself, pushing away from the locker towards the door to the bay. The override code unlocked the door, but it didn't even move. Emergency power reserves were probably completely drained, as evidenced by the lack of a shimmering blue screen over the hole in the bulkhead. He managed to wedge some fingers into the opening and forced the doors open inch by inch, though these were far heavier than the lift doors he'd forced earlier. Finally, twelve inches later, it was open just enough to let him squeeze through. Debris, hydraulic fluid, ordnance, tools, and bodies all floated in the bay, obstructing the path in between him and the two operable fighters at the end of the flight platform. He didn't know if the surrounding chaos was the result of the two mysterious assassins, or the earlier bombardment from the equally mysterious ship, but a quick glance at the giant bay doors that opened out into deep space told him that the two murderers had left. The shuttle they piloted careened out the doors, which started to close behind the small craft. Before it darted out, he just barely caught sight of the nameplate affixed to the rear. Fenway. As another explosion registered in the background, he launched himself straight through the debris. In the back of his mind, he realized he didn't actually hear the explosion, but holding on to the bay doors, he'd felt it, and feeling the vibration through the metal seemed to create the perception of sound in his head. From the state of the bodies, it was clear the emergency had taken them completely by surprise. None of the techs were wearing the environmental suits that would have saved their lives, and the pilots were all helmetless their partially donned flight suits insufficient to save them from the vacuum. He tried not to look at their bloated purple faces as he passed. Except for one, which had a helmet on and was flailing and thrashing around several meters off the deck. 
She was terrified, and calculating the risk in his head, he decided to take it. Better die with honor than live with the shame. He bounced off a tumbling barrel full of lubricant grease and used the collision to redirect himself upward towards the woman. They collided. He grabbed her upper arm, and as they hit the ceiling he pushed off with a grunt, aiming for one of the remaining craft, and prayed that his aim while maneuvering in zero-g was as good as it was with the fire controls of a fighter. It was. They nearly bounced off, but at the last second he grabbed the small handhold near the hatch with his free hand, wrenching the flailing woman towards the fighter with his other. The hatch to the fighter opened far easier than any of the doors he'd opened so far, and a quick glance over the controls told him the craft was in good shape. Whatever had barraged the station had fortunately missed this particular bird. He pushed the woman into the space behind the seat, secured her as best he could with the auxiliary restraint, strapped himself in, fired up the engines, and pulled away from the deck with a quick burst from the maneuvering thrusters, tapping the button that would have opened the exterior bay doors. They didn't budge. Of course, he thought. That would be far too easy. He keyed in an override code for the doors, but they still didn't move. After all that work, he was stuck in the bay. An alarm sounded from his helmet's headset, and he glanced at his console to see what the new emergency was. The core. It was going critical. He had maybe fifteen seconds, twenty tops. Soon the entire station and everything inside would be nothing more than a glowing cloud of molten radioactive slag. He gripped the firing control aimed the guns at the bay door, and fired with everything the little bird had. Out the corner of his eye he saw something move. One of the floating bodies. A pilot. His helmet was on, and the man was struggling to maneuver in the debris field floating over the bay's deck, unable to get enough leverage to launch himself towards the remaining fighter. Civic glanced at the console even as he continued pummeling the doors with shells. Ten seconds. He caught sight of the other pilot's face as he rotated into view, contorted in sheer terror. But there was no time. Either Civic got them out of there now, or he stayed and tried to help the other man, and probably kill all three of them in the process. He could only be so much of a hero. Civic squeezed the trigger of the fighter's guns and the doors blew outward, revealing the safe embrace of empty space beyond. He breathed deep. He hadn't flown in two years, not since... Don't think about it. He kicked in the accelerator. Two G's thrust him back in his seat, and his vision went momentarily dark as his body struggled to keep up. The broken bay doors sailed past, and he shot out into space. Two seconds later, Watchdog Station exploded. Later, Watchdog Station exploded. Chapter 12 Irigoyen Sector, Bolivar System, Ido Bridge, ISS Independence Coming up on the mutinous ships, Admiral, said Lieutenant Whitehorse, though there was no need to say it. Everyone felt it. They felt the distance between them and the alien ship shrink with every passing second. The calm, cool, rational part of Proctor's brain wondered at the science behind it. How amazing it was that whatever field the Golgothics were broadcasting, it was somehow perfectly tuned to be able to influence their actual brain chemistry. The cavewoman part of her brain, strengthening by the second, could only say, Run! Fight! Have sex! Beat the shit out of that ship! Punch Yarbrough! Rub Mumford's beefy shoulders! No! Run! She shook her head and tried to think through the oncoming rush of confusing thoughts and emotions. Steady, people! Use your brains. You know what is rational and what is crazy. Her jaw was clenched so hard her teeth hurt. This was going to be some battle. If they were fighting themselves, and the mutinous ship, and the alien vessel, things would get interesting and deadly very quickly. In weapons range, Admiral, said Whitehorse. Are the mutinous ships in between us and the alien? Perfectly aligned? Yes, ma'am. Proctor nodded as calmly as possible. Was this rational? Was using the ships as cover the right thing to do? The moral, ethical thing to do? The cloud was too thick to rationalize either way. The only course she had was action. Fire! Ballsy, stand by to deploy fighters! 
The Independence and the rest of the fleet accompanying it opened up with a barrage of magrail fire and pulsed laser beams that, under normal circumstances and against a normal enemy, would have torn any ship to shreds within seconds. The magrail slugs and beams shot past the mutinous IDF ships and slammed into the alien ship, which had slowed down and seemed to be holding over Ido. Any effect? Whitehorse shook her head, far more quickly than was probably normal for her. No, ma'am. She whirled to one of her magrail crew officers. You're out of sync. Get it together, Ensign. She slammed her fist down on the tactical console. The Ensign swore under his breath, but to his credit kept it together and relayed instructions to his gun crew. They were all going to lose it soon if they didn't either win or get the hell out of there. Maybe we can weaken one spot if we concentrate our fire. She brought up a schematic of the Golgothic ship. All ships, concentrate fire on. She tapped on a random location on the ship's hull. These coordinates. The computer automatically broadcast them to the tactical station and the rest of the fleet. Ballsy, deploy fighters. All ships, deploy fighters and engage that location on the ship. She held her breath, waiting for the concentrated barrage of Magrel slugs to finally break through. Dozens of fighters from the Independence and her fleet swarmed out, targeting the chosen location on the alien ship. Nothing. Every slug, every round from every fighter, all just bounced off. Every. Single. One. Impossible, she breathed. The primordial rage and terror boiling under the surface was starting to surge up. Admiral, the Devonport is firing on us, yelled Whitehorse. The deck shook. Klaxons rang out. Captain Shi, cease fire immediately or your vessel will be destroyed, she said as calmly and yet urgently as possible. Commander Yarbrough called out from the XO station. Damage on deck seven and eight, forward sections, evacuating section one. The barrage from the Davenport continued, while the Independence and her fleet continued pounding the alien ship to no avail. Damn it. Fine. Alter targeting to the Admiral. The Golgothics are firing. Reading energy levels completely off our normal scales. Lieutenant Whitehorse's hands were a blur on her tactical console. On the view screen, past the mutinous IDF ship, the stationary alien vessel had initiated some sort of pure energy beam. Shimmering, purple-white, it lanced out, not at any ship, but towards the moon below. It bored down through Ido's surface, digging deep into its crust. Debris, dust, and explosions blasted out from the drilling zone in a hellish maelstrom. What the hell? Proctor leaned forward. What is it doing? Commander Mumford shook his head. The beam is an ultra-high-energy composite mix of anti-gallium, boron ions, gamma, X, and ultraviolet rays, along with pure anti-proton ions. Adjusting sensor scales now. He looked up at her, his face draining of color. One hit from that beam and any ship is a goner. Instantly. I'm reading billions of terawatts coming off that thing. The deck shook again. The Davenport was still firing on them, and now a few of the other mutinous ships had joined in, shooting Magrel slugs at her own fleet. Raina Scott's voice boomed over the comm. Shelby, can we turn it down some? Those bastards are hurting my engines. Sorry, Raina, we're in the thick of it. How are we holding up? Raina grunted. I'll keep her together. But one more well-placed railgun slug, and the core starts getting fussy. Raina out. Proctor nodded. Target the Davenport's weapon systems. Fire. The deck pulsed with the regular thumps of magrail fire, and the Davenport surface was peppered with tiny explosions as the slugs tore into the hull. The alien ship is opening fire with their railguns again, said Whitehorse. Their drilling beam is still on, but aimed at the planet. So they can walk and chew gum at the same time, murmured Proctor. Who's getting hit? Mainly the Davenport... A few of the other mutinous ships, one of our ships too. It's basically targeting every ship it has a clear shot at. So our shield is working, she said. God help us. What's the status of the Davenport? Are they still firing on us? No, ma'am. Their laser turrets are dead. Magro tubes destroyed. Reading power fluctuations all over the ship, I think it's going to... Lieutenant Whitehorse didn't even get to finish her sentence. 
The Davenport erupted in a blinding explosion as its core went critical. Did in a blinding explosion as its core went critical. Chapter 13 Irigoyen Sector Bolivar System Ido Bridge ISS Independence When the glow diminished, the expanding cloud of molten slag that had been the ISS Davenport dissipated enough that Proctor could see through to the other side, where the alien ship still drilled into the little moon. Ido now sported a hole the size of the Independence on its surface, and the purple-white beam continued to plunge into it. "'Sir, something's happening,' said Whitehorse. "'Detecting movement on the ship. A port is opening.' Proctor snapped around to the tactical station. Scan it. All bands. We need to see inside that thing or we'll never know how to beat it. Scanning. Whitehorse bit her lip. The opening is still covered by some kind of dampening field, similar to our atmospheric containment fields, except this one is blocking all EM bands. Neutron scan, then. Whitehorse shook her head. Same. Proctor did a double take. They have an EM field that's blocking a neutron scanning beam? She glanced over at Commander Mumford. How? The scientist shrugged. Unknown, Admiral. Apparently their technology far exceeds our own. He deadpanned. Proctor's eyes stayed locked on the viewscreen image of the Golgothic ship drilling into Ido. Commander, you win the Understatement of the Year award. She scratched her chin. No change in its offensive stance? No, Admiral. The other mutinous ships have finally all withdrawn to a distance that appears acceptable to the alien ship. At least it's not firing on them. Or us. So what the hell is it doing, then? As if in answer, something shot out of the port that had opened on the ship. Too fast for Proctor's eyes to track, she glanced at her command console. What the blazes was that? A small tungsten sphere, contents unknown. It's heading straight down into the hole on the planet. Whitehorse glanced up at Proctor. Shall we fire, Admiral? Negative. As long as the ship is not attacking us, we just watch. She noticed Commander Yarbrough eye her with surprise. For now, she added. On the view screen, they all watched the sphere arc down towards the surface of the moon. The purple-white beam shimmered briefly, pulsating in its last gasps then disappeared right as the sphere entered the hole that had opened up on Ido's surface. The entire bridge waited with bated breath, waiting for the inevitable explosion or moonquake, energy spike, or whatever massive destruction the alien device would cause on the small moon. Nothing happened. Lieutenant? Proctor said to Whitehorse. Anything. Sensors are quiet, sir. So what the hell did that thing do? Whitehorse shrugged. Nothing on any bands, just faint tremors. But that looks normal, considering the bastard just drilled a hole down to the moon's core. I can scan using— Yarbrough interrupted them. Look! The ship was moving. Away from the Independence. Away from the small, battered, mutinous idea fleet huddled in the background. And moments later, with the telltale flicker of a Q-jump, it disappeared. Instantly, the intense, overflowing surge of emotions dissipated. Her heartbeat slowed to something normal. Everyone on the bridge breathed a little calmer. Lieutenant Quirty called over from the comm station. Receiving messages from the captains of the mutinous ships, Admiral. They're, uh, apologizing. Profusely and all sincere lack. Well, began Proctor, swiveling around to face her bridge crew. Her eyes drifted over the spot on the deck where Captain Prucha's blood still stained it, then back up to the view screen which still displayed the tiny moon Ido. This certainly qualifies as the oddest alien invasion I've ever seen. Still no changes from the moon? No, ma'am. Whitehorse's brow furrowed. Unless you consider a point zero 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 one percent increase in its mass to be a significant change. In its mass, to be a significant change. <laughs>